It's now my singular pleasure and honor to invite our keynote speaker. And please give Dr. Kabaruka a warm Abuja welcome to the podium. Dr. Donald Kabaruka. Dr. Donald Kabiruka serves as the Senior Advisor at TPG Capital LP. He's also the Chairman and Non-Executive Director of Centum Investment Company Limited since October 11, 2016. Dr. Kabiruka is currently the African Union High Representative for the Peace Fund, Housing Leader in Residence, Harvard Kennedy School, Board Member of World Economic Forum, Board of Trustees, Mandela Institute, Mo Ibrahim Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation, among others. He served as the President and Chairman of African Development Bank from September 2005 till 2015 and also served as the Chairman of the Board. He was the Minister of Finance in Rwanda as well as the Governor for Rwanda for the IMF and World Bank from 1997 to 2005 and the Chief Economist for Inter-Africa Coffee Organization. He has a PhD in economics from University of Glasgow, Scotland. Good morning. And thank you for this very long in, uh, presentation. Of Some of you didn't sound like me, but uh, I have to believe it. But thank you nonetheless. I'm glad to be back to Abuja, Nigeria, and see so many friends. And uh, I'm proud to be the first speaker for this inaugural lecture series. Now, I'll have to apologize in advance. I have very limited time. Uh, and so what I'll do, I have a prepared statement, which I leave behind. So this morning, I'll share with you simply a couple of thoughts, helped by uh, a couple of slides, if they're available, and uh, to give uh, a few suggestions. So, but before I do so, let me give you a context of what is happening in Africa. And I just want you to take a careful look at that uh, chart there in front of you. It tells you the story of how the rest of the world sees, has interpreted the development of Africa over the last decade and a half. I'm not saying this is how we Africans see this is how the rest of the world sees us. So at the turn of the millennium, after two decades of mayhem, uh, that famous publication, you know very well, so it had uh, on the left that this is a hopeless continent. I'm sure you, you know the story. Now, there is a whole argumentation of why they said that. You remember those years? The war in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, a decade of debt crisis, HIV AIDS, and so on. No one gave Africa a chance. But a few years later, please put it back. Uh, uh, a few years later, the same publication said, no, 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 we got it wrong. This is a hopeful continent. And the reason was that for the first time in two decades, real per capita GDP was beginning to exceed demographic increase. And they saw possibilities that this continent might move on. But wait a minute, that was not enough. A couple of years later, the same publication says Africa is rising. Now, from the hopeless continent to a rising continent, there's a journey to travel, is there not? So that narrative of Africa rising itself was very controversial. And it's relevant to what we're discussing today. Because many young people, jobless, would ask, but Africa is rising for whom? For the reasons which the permanent secretary, Shehu, are mentioning. And that is why we are here today, to answer that question. Rising for whom? And how do we deal with those issues? But I want to go a bit further. The same publication, uh, the same public, please go back. The same publication earlier this year uh, put out another story about the new scramble for Africa. The, the, the whole world was out there looking to grab Africa's natural resources and so on. Now, I'm saying this for one simple reason, that 
We have several narratives about Africa. Is Africa growing? Yes, of course, it is growing. Is it growing in all its parts? Of course not. And I want to acknowledge here in front of you permanent secretary, and that is, uh, that is here. It's very important for my Nigerian friends. I didn't produce the charts, so you bear with me. If you look at what is happening in the continent of Africa, you'll find that at the right side, you have got four countries, including the three largest economies, Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola. They are on the lower side of economic growth. I'm saying I did not produce this chart. This is a... <laughs> so, now think of the fact that South Africa, Nigeria, and Angola account for 56% of the GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa, and that brings the numbers down. But if you look on the extreme left, countries like the Ivory Coast, uh, Tanzania, Senegal, Ethiopia, Kenya, my own country and others, who are not so dependent on commodities, they are doing much, much better. And that is again relevant to what we're discussing today, because if the economy is growing, but on the basis of growth in the extractive sectors, mining or oil, and leaves behind growth in other sectors, then you'll have the question of Africa is rising, but rising for whom? Yeah, but let me go back to this story. It's also very important. Because far too often I have heard in countries like Nigeria and uh, other commodity dependent countries, it is all about the global financial crisis. It is about uh, commodities. Now, this is the global financial crisis some time back. You see what happened? Indeed, our economies came tumbling, as you could see but it quickly rebounced alongside the other emerging markets. So Africa recovered much more quickly than was expected. However, here's another story. I'm afraid, okay. So, and this is very important for my Nigerian friends. If you look at the uh, chart on the left, please look at the red line. That's a trend for what has been happening in the commodity world you will see that for the decade from 2000 to about in recent years, the, what we call the commodity super cycle has now flattened out, is back to where it was. But this is very important because when I hear my Nigerian friends say, look, but the oil price has come down. No, it is a super cycle which has receded. Because remember, we come from an oil plus of $24 some time back. So even at $60, at $55, actually the market is doing quite okay, except that the super cycle has ended. That is a story I wanted to share with you. In other words, at some point, uh, my friends in Nigeria, well, I would think about how about one day and you wake up and you find Nigeria without oil. Think about Nigeria without oil. In fact, it turns out this economy is doing much better on that angle than many of us would agree. The, this economy has diversified quietly, slowly, but it requires a push. I was uh, asking my peers here uh, how Nigeria is doing on the revenue to GDP ratio, in other words, the capacity to fund your economy from your own resources. Now, if my numbers are right, Nigeria is still about 7% uh, of GDP. Now, the average for Sub-Saharan Africa is 15%. Countries like Kenya are doing 18%. Countries like Morocco are doing above 21%. So, we can do much better in terms of increasing efficiency, in terms of increasing capacity to fund our own economies. It is important I say these things because we cannot talk about uh, SMEs in abstract. And that is my, my second point. <clears throat> you see, when I was coming here, Sheo called me and said, look, you need to come and talk about financing SMEs. My answer to him was, yes, I will come, he insisted. 
But I say I will not simply talk about financing SMEs because SMEs are challenged by many things other than financing. Let me, let me explain. Let me, let me just explain uh, what I have in mind. Think of uh, a young owner of a garage in Kaduna, or in Kigali, or in uh, Nairobi. They repair cars, they've had access to financing, business is good, but then there are power shortages probably three times a day. It is unlikely that even with financing that this entrepreneur who is trying very hard will make a living. So that is only one side. But think of uh, other challenges they may face. These could uh, include, for example, multiple level taxation. I don't know if you have that problem in Nigeria. They might include, for example, ray type, no access to government procurement. They might even include providing goods and services to the public, to government or state or the federation, and not being paid on time. In fact, if I recall, I'm going to ask uh, Andrew if this is true, Standard Chartered Bank and I think uh, CDC had developed a program, what they call the supply chain finance. So that is through a number of commercial banks to fund uh, some of these young entrepreneurs who have provided services or goods to the public sector, but they're not being paid on time. They're being paid, say, after five, six, seven months. And this supply chain finance has done wonders in a few countries. It is something you want to look into. So simply to, to emphasize, I'll come to, to finance, that finance is a problem, but finance has got a context. That context is macroeconomic, that context is peace and stability. That context is regulations. That context is rules which are good, policies which are good, but applied in an asymmetrical way. If rules applied in a symmetrical for everyone the same, the chances are these companies might be able to, uh, to succeed. Now, the toolboxes we know uh, of what to do uh, once the environment is in place. Let me give you an example of one. Hey, I hope this thing works now. Mm, no. Okay, just a second. Here. So, about uh, four years before I left office at the African Development Bank, uh, I had an idea uh, of trying out something new. Believe me, I had a lot of ideas, many of which never came to fruition. But sometimes they did. In this case, we worked with the government of Denmark. Uh, I think with the government of Spain. And the idea was, suppose we set up a Pan-African Guarantee Fund. And then this Guarantee Fund will work with uh, commercial banks. We'll figure out uh, what the commercial banks consider to be viable businesses by young people and take up 50% of the risks. This fund is based in Nairobi. I want to urge people in DBN to get in touch with them because the model seems to be working wonders. It's simply that the capital base is still very small. It, it was tried out in a few countries first, but it's something we want to explore because I had the TN Nigeria. These are the central bank or the ministry has begun something like this. Now, for it to succeed though, there are two things. One should be aware of financial repression. You should allow the markets to function, only picking up what is the market failure in a market-friendly way. It's something I need to emphasize. Uh, another example I can give in my own country, uh, you know commercial banks, uh, I know commercial bankers I invited guests this morning, so I want to make sure that you invite me next time. <laughs> In many of our countries, commercial bankers make very good money buying treasury bills, is it not? Yes. Yeah. I'm not saying they should not, because uh, it's a business and treasury bills are there. So in my country, it was decided that, look, after the end of the year, from net revenue, uh, 
a small percentage of that net revenue will be put into a pooled fund by all the commercial banks to which the government will match those funds dollar for dollar and that fund, the guarantee fund, will be used to finance some of the sub small businesses on a 50-50% basis. Now, it has had its own challenges, but it has provided for what I think is a market-friendly way to adjust for market failures. Now, these are tools, I think, here in Nigeria, from what I've been told, uh, you have many of them in, uh, in place. I want to encourage you to continue. I've been told the central bank uh, has a number of initiatives. I'm not well positioned to know whether your central bank is the ideal instrument for that. That is a debate you must have among yourselves. Uh, I happen to believe that our central banks cannot be simply not watchmen uh, in different what is going on in the economy, but they have constraints. And those constraints, which are related to their principal mandates, are things which in every country one has to think carefully about what it does. And therefore, this is why I think the creation of the DBN was a very good idea. I want to say here that the first time I was approached, I just don't recall whether it was Mansu or it was Shehu about the idea of uh, participating in the capital of the Development Bank of Nigeria. I was very enthusiastic, extremely enthusiastic for those reasons. Uh, however, in my conversation, either with uh, Mansur or Shehu, or Minister Ngozi at the time, I don't recall, I said, look, I am not a doctrinaire on the issue of development banks. However, there are conditions for a development bank to succeed. And if those conditions are not in place, it will fail. And we discussed what those conditions could be. And from what I heard today, uh, Shehu, you seem to be going in the right direction. If you are, you'd be able to support the SMEs. Condition number one, the one I was mentioning. It is important as you do correction for market failures, for SMEs or small business as a whole, that you do so in a market-friendly way. I don't have to elaborate on this. But the second condition is that you have to expand your funding base, not become too much reliant on the states. And I'm glad to hear that the EIB, the World Bank, and others are participating. Please continue looking for more equity partners so that you become less and less reliant on the state. The third condition is governance. Governance in terms of your board, governance in terms of investment decisions, governance in terms of the way in which the government leaves you to take decisions based on the market principles. If you do that, my model for development banks is the BNDS of Brazil. I'm not saying it is perfect. I understand the new president is having an issue uh, with them. But this bank, the BNDS, has done exactly what you are trying to do with DBN here. Look at the total assets of this bank. These figures are for 2016. It's bigger than the World Bank, several times bigger. And what it has done is exactly what you're trying to do here. Counter-cyclical action, correct for market failures, lead on infrastructure, the kind of things which commercial banks would find risky. Now, they've had criticism that they have focused mainly on very large corporations, not MSMEs. I don't have enough facts for that, but that's something you can correct for. But for me, if Nigeria has these ambitions of having a development bank which can correct for market failures, take on the cyclical action, fund infrastructure, that is a model to look at, and then you modify it by Nigerian uh, conditions. Let me end this. Uh, I said I have a little time by also pointing out that in the 1960s and 70s, development banks were actually a normal policy proposition. Learning on what happened in Europe, especially in Germany and many other countries, where development banks were leaders 
in funding small businesses. But then because they were not operating on the principles I was enumerating here, they fell into a governance conundrum. Many of them were causing fiscal problems, debt issues, and so they were uh, scrapped in many African countries. But I think we have now learned lessons of how to make them work better. And I'm convinced that here in Nigeria, from what I've heard from Shehu, I think we are going in the right direction. I want to, to encourage you. Let me finish by talking about the CFTA. I was in Yami at the AU summit, and I was very, very pleased to see that Nigeria <coughs> came forward to sign the free trade area. Uh, so we now have everything in place. Over the next 12 months, uh, work will be done to on issues like rules of origin, uh, dispute resolution, anti-dumping, the kind of things you know which you need to make sure the NFTA functions properly. It's an important issue for small businesses. It's an important issue for small businesses because those are the ones who suffer most from the restrictions behind the border, at the border, and after the border. The big businesses have a way of going around it. The big businesses get a lot of benefits from our governments tax holidays, and other benefits. Big business multinational corporations will have multiple locations. They know how to work on these things. It is the small businesses which suffer because of tariff restrictions, non-tariff restrictions, weak payment systems, and so on. And so for me, this CFTA beyond a, a signal of bringing the African economies together, expanding the investment base, it is a hugely important engine for our small businesses. And this is why I'm happy that Nigeria is now a member. And I should add that the CFTA is not simply about goods. It's also about services. In fact, we estimate that probably about half of the benefits to be generated by the free trade area will be services. Think of Nigerian banks operating outside Nigeria. Think of how many companies here in the financial services, digital services, in logistics, could locate in East Africa, in Southern Africa, once the CFTA is in place. Think of the forward and backward linkages to small companies. And therefore, I want to urge you to continue to support the government uh, in the effort to, to make the CFTA a reality, because that will be the uh, a, if you want the non-financial way of supporting businesses. Because today we can talk about financing, about the toolbox, about the different methods, but these are the bread and butter of small businesses. And let me also point out the most important one. Today, if you look at African economies, where we are mostly challenged now in terms of the combination between development, environment, and security, is where also you have got the lowest levels of uh, 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 employment creation. This why you have limited social mobility. This why inclusion is a problem. And so as we develop small businesses, it's not simply about the economics. It's not simply about the jobs. It's about stability of our countries. And therefore, as we look at the meeting point between how we finance these businesses, how we provide them an environment, how we support them at macroeconomic level, how we support them from a free trade area level, all things have to gel together. And if we do that, I think we'll be able to provide jobs for our people. I think you have heard about the story that uh, many African countries, the common man or common woman is not very much impressed by the headline growth in GDP numbers. And this, for the reasons she was mentioning, the last list of creating jobs. But there is more than that. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I was looking at the demographics of Nigeria. Uh, let me just check again my numbers. I am told between 2000, uh, the, when we're talking about uh, the hopeless continent, 
Nigeria had a population of, in 1990, the population of Nigeria was 100 million people. Is that right? Is that right? About 100 million people. Now, since the year 2000, your population has increased by 68.5 million people. That is almost if you bring South Africa and Benin together. It's like if you get a number of equal countries in one country. So it means Nigeria does not need 6% GDP growth. You need much more than that for quite a long time. So condition number one, you need GDP growth indeed, but which is higher than population increase and which is not a volatile growth depending on the oil price. It has to be a sustained one over time. So this one. Condition number two, it has to be inclusive along the lines we're discussing. Reaching small businesses, reaching women and men, all parts of the country, and so on. And it has to be a growth which looks beyond Nigeria, because Nigeria is an engine, one of the engines of African economies, like South Africa, like Ethiopia and the East. We need these engines to grow so that the smaller countries around you can grow as well. So I want to wish you well in your deliberations. I am leaving behind my texts. I was not able to read it because of time constraints. Please, you can refer to it. But I'm hoping that we can continue uh, these conversations in the future. I am convinced that what you have done here in rebuilding the economic buffers after the crisis will stand you very well, but you have to continue. It has to continue. There are some issues in the macroeconomic space which I think requires attention. Number two, as I've just said, economic growth, which is less volatile and which is certainly above population. Thirdly, please remember what has been said frequently, economic growth is not the same thing as economic transformation. Economic growth, you expand the cake. Economic transformation, you move an economy from operating at the lower end of the global value chains to up the ladder. Because that's where jobs are created. So economic growth and economic transformation at the same time. And then addressing these issues of inequalities uh, and inclusion, leaving no one behind. And there are two ways to do it. This is how it's done all over the world. The first one is access to quality education. Every African child must have access to quality education. Not the kind of education you received, because they'll be graduating the jobs of the future. That is the number one, which assures inclusion, stability, and transformation. And the second one is what we're discussing the small businesses which create jobs all over the world. And that's important for our economics, it's important for our political stability. So thank you for inviting me. I wish you all and each Nigeria success. Thank you.